start with hypertension. Hypertension basically is a, is a sustained high blood pressure above normal. We will go into that uh, in a bit. So what do we have here? We have an introduction. It is the most, one of the most common health problems in adults in the, on the globe. Okay. It is the leading, let me just get this out of the way. It is the leading, as you can see here, the leading risk factor for development of cardiovascular diseases. The number one thing is hypertension. And mind you, this table I've, I've picked up from a latest uh, classification, which is being followed uh, or should be followed by clinicians in treating, uh, uh, detecting and treating and preventing hypertension uh, globally. Uh, I, I, will, I will share with you the reference for that. And the rest of the, actually most of the lecture is based on that document. So uh, it's a leading uh, risk factor for cardiovascular diseases. Uh, in the US, for example, approximately 25% of all adults above the age of 18 have high BP. That's a very significant amount of people. So 25 in 100 people in the US, um, uh, according, to, according to last run latest statistics, uh, they suffer from some sort of BP uh, abnormality. Uh, and, and this is a serious concern. Uh, more interesting uh, points about it is that younger men than younger women suffer more uh, uh, with hypertension. Uh, there is a racial component to hypertension. Uh, people with, uh, there's a socioeconomic uh, component as well. And older people have uh, more incidence of hypertension than uh, younger people. Uh, men have higher blood pressures than women uh, un until uh, the women hit menopause. And after menopause, it, it's been observed that they develop hypertension more than pre-menopausal women. So I just want you to uh, uh, visualize this, this small list. And uh, it's, uh, it's a good investment for you uh, as future doctors to see uh, that cardiovascular factors, which are one of the number one uh, death-causing mortality death causing diseases in the world right now, uh, cardiovascular diseases, the most uh, prominent risk factor for these cardiovascular diseases is actually hypertension. Okay, so this is very, very important to note. That's why we are dedicating half of this lecture to your study of hypertension so that you are sensitive about this. And when you inshallah do end up practicing, you are very aware of your patient most of whom, uh, let's hope not, but most of whom will practically be coming in with hypertension and you'll be dealing with that. The second is age. Obviously, no denying age. Age is a progressive phenomena. Uh, but as age goes on, you are more prone to cardiovascular risk factors. Diabetes mellitus, unfortunately, is one of the number one causes of cardiovascular risk factors itself. Uh, then you have all sorts of uh, uh, lipid uh, metabolism. Uh, which causes cardiovascular risk factors. Then you have kidney diseases. Uh, you have uh, family histories there, obesity, and physical inactivity, which again, uh, distressingly is seen in the youth of today. Uh, sedentary lifestyle, even in the youth, uh, leads to uh, uh, premature hypertension uh, uh, casualty in young population. It's very, very bad. And then the absolutely horrendous and useless uh, habit of uh, tobacco smoking uh, is one of the leading causes of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we will be looking at this part of this diagram. We'll be revisiting this uh, table later on in this lecture, inshallah. Okay. So what are the types? So basically, there are two main types. Uh, there are, you will find all sorts of explanations in Brighton and, and uh, in other books and uh, over the net, uh, uh, knowledge is not the issue here. The issue is how do you formulate it? So I've, I've tried to make it simple for you so that you remember uh, uh, the main uh, takeaway messages here. So one is primary. What, what do you mean by primary disorder? Any disorder, if you use the word primary with it, it means that it in, a, in itself is the problem. Uh, as opposed to secondary, uh, I'll explain this uh, business in a, in a bit. I'll just need to define it. Secondary is secondary to something else which is causing the problem. So 
when we say that primary hypertension we mean it we what we mean is uh, hypertension which is caused by a cardiovascular issue probably caused uh, in origin however when we say hypertension is secondary we are saying that it did not originate in the circulation uh, so it originated somewhere else so uh, 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 diabetics have hypertension now diabetes is an endocrinological problem okay with the pancreas or obesity and so on and so forth so it's more endocrine in nature but it leads to hypertension yes so this is what we mean by secondary uh, another very famous uh, trigger for hypert hypertension formation secondary hypertension is kidney disease so kidney disease is a whole set of uh, issues with the kidney <clears throat> okay then those issues with the kidney lead to you can say it's a side effect the side effect of kidney disease a very famous one big one is hypertension so that's typical typically discussed on the secondary hypertension coming to primary hypertension primary hypertension is also called essential hypertension and it accounts for the majority of cases that you'll be seeing eventually in your practice uh, and that's the kicker it does not have uh, any significant evidence uh, other than probably obesity uh, it you cannot pinpoint why this chap has high blood pressure so this is the this is the off throwing part of it uh, he or she will uh, give the history and the examination will reveal and the investigations will reveal that this person has elevated high blood pressure uh, uh, and it fulfills your criteria the diagnostic criteria but you would not be able to pinpoint the cause of it and this is the problem however since these are the majority of cases uh, they have developed detailed protocols of how to deal with it so that's good uh, secondary uh, hypertension the whole role of your management and your diagnosis should be to go for the cause of this uh, hypertension and because unless you don't treat the cause you won't treat the hypertension uh, that is not the case in primary hypertension in primary hypertension hypertension itself is the symptom and the disease uh, since there is no evidence of any other disease we just treat the hypertension okay this is the document that i was referring to the seventh report of the gnc the joint national committee and what does that committee do it basically looks at blood pressure the various aspects of blood pressure is how to prevent it uh, if it's not prevented if it's there then how to detect it uh, evaluate it so, sort it out what type of blood pressure aberration is there and then importantly how to treat it okay this is basically a us department of health and human services uh, initiative uh, and uh, uh, i've searched uh, uh, for a latest version uh, but could only find the seventh uh, report on it which is dated 2004 Uh, maybe there is a new thing out uh, i have gone to the pubmed website as well but i couldn't find uh, if anyone knows of a more recent uh, endeavor on this issue please comment in the uh, section below the video and uh, so that we all are updated about it but this is as as uh, this is uh, okay for our uh, reference for a basic science lecture so i'm going to go ahead with that so primary hypertension according to this document basically uh, don't be worried It's, there's a lot of uh, data here but it's uh, it's a uh, it's a walk in the park so uh, in this uh, table it's very simple uh, he has compared the the authors have compared the latest uh, document with the the previous one so there are some very important changes uh, as you'll see uh, optimal means uh, there's no problem uh, the person is actually quite healthy uh, even more than normal optimal means Uh, the way it was originally supposed to be uh, so systolic blood pressure over diastolic blood pressure you know that 120 80 business it's that so if the person has less than 120 80 less blood pressure than that uh, the old category labeled him, this person as optimal but the new cat category will label this person as normal so clearly you see that there is a deterioration in standards Uh, this is because hypertension is not stopping it just moves on and carries on and the more people becoming sicker so when they jotted down the sixth uh, report uh, uh, the situation was different and when it 
uh, time came for a revision to the seventh uh, report, uh, the situation has had deteriorated. So optimal became normal, normal and borderline became prehypertension. Okay, so all the uh, in betweens between 120 and 139 in systolic and uh, 89 in diastolic now is referred to as prehypertension remember this is not a disease but it's a it's a it's a warning sign that things are not optimal they're not certainly not normal now we don't use the word normal for this so anything which is above 120 and above 80 is something uh, to be reckoned with <clears throat> the cutoff line is 139 on systolic and 89 on diastolic okay right so Then you have the hypertension uh, statistic. Uh, there's, uh, there's consensus on this. Anything above 140 and anything above uh, or equal to 90 sustained is hypertension. And then you have the substages of, uh, of hypertension, stage one, two, and three, which were then changed in this classification. Stage one uh, remains the same, but stage two and three were merged into stage two. So clearly uh, the incidence ha had gone in had gone up anything above 160 uh, is basically now stage two uh, and up anything above 99 diastolic is now stage two it's, it's important to look at it from things from a historical perspective as well because that shows you the progression of disease and how people are dealing with it now experts are dealing with it now uh, classification of uh, based on this the new classification of blood pressure for adults is this basically uh, the normal is systolic less than 120, uh, diastolic less than 80, prehypertension, as I mentioned, is 120 to 139, one, <clears throat> 139 being the cutoff, and in diastolic, it's uh, 89 is the cutoff, okay? Uh, stage one, hypertension, these are the figures, and then stage two is anything more than 160 systolic and more than 100 diastolic. This is, uh, these are, this is the way that hypertension should be uh, diagnosed based on these values. Uh, recommendation, checkup recommendation, I found this uh, to be interest uh, to be of interest of, uh, for you. A normal person who has normal blood pressure uh, should be rechecked anyway. We are talking about adults here. Uh, uh, in uh, within two, uh, uh, two two years. Okay, and remember these are adults without any or end organ damage. I'll be speaking about end organ damage in a bit. So people who <clears throat> Uh, right now don't have end organ damage uh, with uh, their <clears throat> blood pressure measurements. So normal needs to be uh, checked every two years, prehypertension, we check them every one year, uh, stage one hypertension confirmed within two months, uh, whether this chap has modified his uh, lifestyle uh, or not, we'll talk about this. Stage two hypertension, basically a more aggressive uh, way uh, to not just pursue his hypertension, but also look for the sequelae of hypertension, i.e. Uh, which uh, organ or organs are being damaged uh, by this hypertension and how to limit this. Okay. So uh, the contributing factors, uh, basically we, we divide them into two risk factors and lifestyle factors. Risk factors are things which uh, uh, are pretty much uh, fixed uh, you can't do much about it, family history, nothing can be done about that race. Diabetes, if it's there, then diabetes is the main cause and you can limit the, the effects of uh, the cardiovascular effects that diabetes has. You can't really reverse them uh, once they come into play and they're pretty much in the progressive forward direction. Age again is something which uh, happens to everyone and age-related blood pressure changes also happen to everyone. The extent may be uh, different in people but they certainly do happen. So for example, arteries do harden because of the position of uh, fat in the walls uh, and decrease in the elastic, elastic tissue, the nature of elastic tissue uh, itself denatures uh, along with age. So there's no stopping that. Uh, you can only retard it, but this just forwards. Age is not a disease, but it's a reality. These are the fixed risk factors. However, lifestyle factors, uh, they can, uh, thankfully, they can be changed, looked at and changed if the salt intake is more, uh, decrease the salt, and we'll, we'll be talking about salt in a bit. 
it's an interesting discussion. Uh, uh, decrease calorie intake, uh, control obesity, uh, increase physical activity. Uh, hopefully, alcohol consumption is not an issue in this country. And in women, oral contraceptive, uh, oral contraceptives is has a very clear uh, link with developing hypertension in females. So lifestyle changes, modifications are the first things in a physician's mind to address, not the pill that is prescribed and the patient then becomes a pill popper. <clears throat> first, you need to discuss and convince the person to change his uh, uh, eating habits, uh, his uh, or her obesity, level of exercise, and so on. And uh, many patients do respond to these lifestyle modifications and they don't need any pharmacological uh, treatment. Something which uh, uh, physicians these days uh, are a bit trigger happy, I would say, and uh, they go for the uh, medication as a first uh, port of call, which uh, shouldn't be the case in our new generation, hopefully. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the manifestations or symptoms of uh, essential hypertension, well, most of them are asymptomatic. Uh, uh, they, they will feel uh, the complications of hy hypertension and maybe, maybe that is the point where they come and see you. Uh, so uh, essential hypertension, since it's a response of circulation itself causing the blood pressure, high blood pressure, uh, it does remain asymptomatic in most cases. Uh, however, Sustained high blood pressure eventually uh, accelerates atherosclerosis and actually this is the main disease causing component in hypertensives because this causes all sorts of cardiovascular disorders and uh, as I mentioned, uh, we will revisit this uh, table and now we will look at this part of the table. Okay, so they are saying and remember if you have the time to look at the previous report uh, you will have a different organization of these diseases. This is very important, and hence it's important to see the historical perspective here, in the sense that some of these diseases were uh, on top in the last report, but in the latest one, according to what I have found, this is the latest document, uh, the heart as an organ is the number one recipient of uh, atherosclerotic uh, uh, insult in hypertensive. So in hypertensive patient, eventually, uh, as of latest data, heart effects gets affected most. You have left ventricular hypertrophy being the number one feature uh, of heart damage uh, in hypertensives. Then you have uh, angina, which is uh, pain of uh, ischemia, heart uh, myocardial ischemia. You have uh, revascularization. You have heart failure. Uh, so advanced patients of hypertension uh, uh, go into heart failure. When they, when they present uh, to the doctor. Then the second recipient of the injury is brain. You have strokes, uh, you have dementia. Then look at this, CKD, chronic kidney disease. Uh, very, very discussed, uh, about, uh, discussed uh, 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 matter in uh, hypertension is the effect uh, that hypertension has on kidney. Now, remember, don't be confused here. The, these things are bi-directional, okay? Uh, kidney disease causes hypertension and hypertension causes kidney disease, okay? So let's, let's be very clear. Uh, there are a set of kidney diseases which cause hypertension. This is not that list. That list will come up, uh, come up later on under secondary hypertension. This list is basically hypertension causing kidney disease okay so sustained high blood pressure damages the vessels of kidney this is what being is, is what being is what being said peripheral art artery disease is again uh, that thing which constant uh, increase sustained high blood pressure within vessels uh, triggers uh, a response from the uh, 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 atherosclerosis in the sense that there is more deposition of, uh, of, of fat in the wall and also sustained blood pressure challenges the elasticity of uh, arteries, of vessels in the long term, leading to decrease, quicker decrease in their elastic profile, uh, beating age to it. Uh, retinopathy, uh, so again, atherosclerosis of the retinal vessels will lead to 
ischemia of the retina and changes in the in, in the vision of the person so uh, hypertension through its atherosclerotic uh, weapon uh, causes all sorts of organ damage and this is uh, the way to look at essential hypertension so it's a it's a silent morbidity and mortality maker uh, silent because it's mostly asymptomatic itself it expresses itself via this weapon on the various crucial uh, organs of the body diagnosis again uh, it's not just one uh, high reading of blood pressure that would prompt you to label this person as a hypertensive uh, there are protocols and they should really be followed uh, to the spirit that's not to trigger happy in labeling people with diabetes or hypertension based on single readings that's most unfortunate uh, repeated blood uh, rather serial repeated serial blood pressure measurements are the way to go <clears throat> diabetes is based uh, I you hypertension is based on an average of at least two or more uh, high blood pressure readings taken at each of two or more visits so the person you ask the person to come back uh, if he or she has come to you once and you had uh, two or more uh, high blood pressure readings in that visit ask the person to repeat the visit or go home and, and, and make a diary of serial blood pressures and then you study that diary and then repeat the blood pressure readings in your office as well if all of this leads to a sustained image of high blood pressure then you should be prone to make a diagnosis of hypertension and then you have all sorts of uh, lab tests x-rays etc to exclude any secondary cause so if this person we're obviously discussing essential hypertension it doesn't have a cause or probable cause uh, so uh, how do you arrive at that when you exclude all the secondary uh, causes then you label this person as a essential hypertensive uh, patient uh, a, a, a leaf from guyton is very interesting i've taken this graph as well so uh, i'll be brief here you can read this up uh, a little more detail from your book uh, <clears throat> basically one of the views and a very strong view uh, on hypertension is that people generally uh, are can be can be divided into two types uh, based on their salt response so some people see, uh, seem to be respond uh, to be responsive uh, to be very uh, sensitive to salt uh, while the others are not much so the first category the the, the one who are salt sensitive they basically uh, they respond to salt much more acutely so if they take a known amount of salt in their diet and they don't uh, uh, bother with decreasing it they are prone to become hypertensives much more quicker than the salt uh, uh insensitive people uh, we are not saying that salt insensitive people are somehow immune to the bad effects of high salt intake we are not saying that we are saying that all of us are sensitive to to salt because salt uh, will increase the uh, 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 ecf volume and lead to high blood pressure over a long period of time or a, or a broad period of time but what we are saying is there are people who are more prone to these changes in response to their salt intake and then there are people who are less prone uh, to, to uh, the salt that they take and this graph is a clear testimony to that thing uh, the black curve is a normal response to high intake of salt so he's taken normal intake at point d and then increase the salt in this normal person uh, it just uh, <clears throat> uh, he just threw this out the extra salt uh, as you can see that salt intake and output uh, uh, statistic that it's just the curve did not shift anywhere it just uh, moved nicely vertically along and when uh, the person was at normal intake uh, his, his blood pressure was around 100 and when you increase the diet intake maybe slightly a few degrees to the right but negligible really and what, where did that extra salt and water go uh, the kidneys threw it out because this is a normal person we are talking about now we are talking about essential hypertension uh, tension scenario the two responders so the red the red one is the salt insensitive person so this curve it got displaced and became the red curve so this person's response uh, to 
uh, normal diet, uh, normal intake, uh, because he's a, he, this person is a hypertensive, uh, is his hypertension is this is his hypertension anyway. And now this person is uh, basically on a normal intake of salt. Now you've increased that normal intake of salt. So the blood pressure would uh, uh, sort of remain in the same category. Although if you, if you really look at it threadbare, there's a slight uh, rightward shift, uh, minuscule really. Uh, so this person is really salt insensitive. Uh, as you can see that salt did not do much to his uh, uh, blood pressure. However, look at the blue line, the salt sensitive person. So these are the people who are very sensitive to their salt intake. And if it was normal, it was less than 150. But as soon as you gave him that same high intake of salt that you gave your normal person and the salt non-responder, <clears throat> this person's BP shot up and went above 150. So clearly, uh, there's a difference between essential hypertensives as salt, salt insensitive people and salt, uh, salt sensitive people. An interesting discussion to take up uh, from Guyton. Uh, again, uh, this, this is an important aspect uh, when you're diagnosing your patient. Okay, so uh, treatment. Uh, so treatment, basically, the main objective is to keep the blood pressure obviously less. But how, what is the uh, cutoff line here? Uh, the cutoff line is uh, less than 140 and less than 90. Less than 140 is systolic, less than 90 uh, diastolic. Basically, if you remember the... Uh, the definitions and the statistics uh, we used early on in the diagnosis of hypertension. Uh, this is the cutoff line for uh, hypertension and uh, uh, you want to keep it lower than these values and that's the mainstay of treatment. Now, uh, what is uh, the second most uh, important part of the treatment is to prevent mortality, morbidity and mortality. The difference is morbidity is a disease causation and the suffering that comes with it, while mortality is death. So obviously, uh, one of the mainstays is to decrease both morbidity uh, and mortality. Okay, and how to do it? Uh, there is a lifestyle modification uh, uh, management protocol, which uh, is being shown here again from the same document. Number one is uh, uh, weight reduction. Uh, and there are details of this, you can, you can study this. What is interesting is they have given a statistic of how much weight reduction uh, you can, how much decrease in uh, your systolic blood pressure uh, can you achieve per uh, unit body weight by this measure only. This is a very interesting um, statistic, uh, especially for uh, people who are above their uh, normal weight, uh, their normal BMI, uh, and they suffer from uh, some sort of hypertension, uh, weight reduction itself. Look at the stat. This is uh, uh, motivation enough to go for hitting that treadmill or going to the park. Uh, diet uh, rich in fruits, vegetables, low in fat, low in dairy. Uh, and look at the, the dividend that you get for that. Okay. Then sodium intake. Uh, as uh, uh, people move along the age, clock, uh, salt needs to come down. They have shown, uh, Guyton discusses this uh, in some significant detail. Uh, do read it once. Uh, it uh, gives you a picture of how salt is such a big issue as you move along the age continuum uh, that you need to really decrease the salt. And you, you must have observed that elders in your house, uh, they, they are very picky or finicky about salt. And there's a, there's a reason to that because in old age, uh, salt can create more uh, volume related issues and directly more blood pressure related issues than when you are youthful. The kidneys are older, they are frail, uh, their handling of the salt may not be uh, spiffy um, as, a, as, a, as a younger person. And so it's better to eat less than to load your ECF volume and then uh, do the kidney not a big favor. Uh, just eat less salt. Okay, and look at the dividend that you get on systolic blood pressure reduction. Physical activity cannot be uh, argued more, is essential for uh, blood pressure reduction. Uh, uh, and hopefully this may not be a big issue, but in the West, it is a big issue uh, to decrease the alcohol consumption. And this also has a, uh, a significant 
uh, role in uh, systolic blood pressure reduction. <clears throat> right. Uh, pharm pharmacological treatment, basically uh, 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 a range of drugs uh, are there uh, to help. And as you go down this list, basically uh, you are uh, uh, dealing with uh, new diabetics. You can uh, treat them with diuretics. Diuretics basically are drugs which uh, uh, increase the volume output of the kidney. So you're getting rid of extra volume, bringing the pressure down. These are diuretics. And as you go down this, uh, uh, this ladder, the hypertension per person is becoming more complex. So you're talking stage one and stage two here uh, as you go down. Also, there are protocols where you combine two different class of drugs. So there are single drug treatments of hypertension, simple hypertensives. Then there are two drug treatments uh, protocols defined for uh, resistant hypertension, which is uh, which is more difficult to treat. So they have to use two uh, drugs and uh, try to manage it. And remember, pharmacological treatment cannot be, uh, I'm saying this again, cannot be the first thing that you do with the, with the patient. The first thing that you have to do is counsel about lifestyle modification uh, and put this chap on lifestyle modification. Make notes for him. Do hard work as a physician. It's hard work getting people to change their habits. So all this, all this business, this needs to be talked, talked to, talk to the guy, try to convince the person uh, that these are the uh, modifications which will significantly reduce the blood pressure on the on its own, uh, and then ask him to come back for a follow up appointment, and then when you, and, and this is that running theme of hypertension that I was posting on, uh, on Facebook, uh, is. Uh, put him on uh, a, a, a medication, uh, conserve, be conservative in using of uh, med medication, uh, especially when you can prevent this. So if, if, if he or she only uh, shows resistant, uh, his hypertension is uh, resistant uh, itself to your lifestyle modification chart, which you made meticulously for this guy, only then go for the pharmacological uh, treatment. Uh, so we've done the uh, primary hypertension, the essential hypertension. Uh, uh, coming to uh, secondary hypertension. Okay, so as we mentioned uh, earlier, that primary hypertension, uh, essential hypertension does not have a obvious cause. Uh, secondary hypertension does, okay? And in this, uh, one of the main uh, causes relate to kidney. Kidney itself can cause hypertension. And we'll, we'll look into this, we'll go into details. Uh, <clears throat> a word of advice here is that I'll be, because of the scope of the lecture and the time duration has uh, put some restrictions on me. Uh, this cannot be a horrendously long uh, lecture. Uh, in secondary hypertension, the books have given lots of uh, other causes of secondary hypertension. So you can imagine uh, and I will show you uh, the, the, the causation uh, table as well. Uh, there are a lot of organs which, if they become faulty, they can cause hypertension. Uh, but I've picked renal because Guyton has picked renal uh, and has invested most of the comments, the main comments on kidney causing hypertension. So I will focus on this. However, word of caution is you have to at least give one reading to the other causes as well, okay? Uh, so those other organs uh, that Guyton and other books talk about, which may cause hypertension under the secondary hypertension, heading, you have to at least give it one reading, all right? However, my uh, lecture from this point onwards will focus on mainly the kidney causes. So the, single, the largest single cause of secondary hypertension is renal, renal cause. And all these sorts of problems with the kidney, the famous uh, diseases, glomerulonephritis, ac acute renal failure, renal obstruction by a stone, uh, polycystic kidney disease, diabetes comes in again. So diabetes also causes kidney disease, which then causes hypertension. You can see the enormous mess uh, a person can be uh, being a diabetic and type one is uh, again, uh, you're born with it, but type two pretty much you put it upon yourself 
uh, again it has genetic component but if you can just manage your diet and not be obese and uh, just easy on the junk food and this sort of thing and and do more exercise uh, di diabetes type 2 can be managed but once it gets sets it, uh, sets itself up in some in a, in a person then kidney goes then cardiovascular goes because it triggers hypertension and strange renal disease is all obviously the last station in this uh, sad saga of kidney disease after which hypertension becomes a raging problem in this person so kidney is one issue that one has to deal with and now you have to deal with hypertension as well okay um there was a graph okay fine so this is basically let me just show you again these are the causes of uh, kidney diseases these are kidney diseases causing hypertension okay now each one of them has a story of its own okay you may look at it in your own time all right however <clears throat> the mainstay of guyton and other standard textbooks is this renovascular hypertension what is this so while we can talk about an acute renal failure shutdown of the kidney and how does that cause uh, fluid retention which then goes on to cause hypertension uh, this particular aspect this slide basically is about renovascular hypertension so something is so we are talking about the original issue the original issue is something is wrong with the vasculature of the kidney not its parenchyma not originally you're talking about the the first shot that was fired the initial insult okay uh, so the initial event was something was wrong something became wrong in the vasculature of the kidney okay so be very clear renovascular is a big topic in in uh, in hypertension secondary hypertension one of the main causes of hypertension kidney induced hypertension are due to uh, renovascular causes <clears throat> so this is where that renin angiotensin 2 axis uh, will come into play okay that's why i asked people to revise this thoroughly so that we can negotiate this slide okay so now let's uh, slowly descend into the thick of it we have three scenarios three main scenarios okay uh, one is a renin secreting tube okay so what will what will happen renin is you know where renin is secreted from the jg cells right is part of the <clears throat> mainly the efferent arterio also part of uh, some of the efferent but mainly the efferent arterio okay so it's again a vascular issue now it has developed a, a tumor what will happen what will happen is uh, this tumor will abnormally uh, increase production of renin renin will then uh, lead to a equal amount of abnormal levels of angiotensin 2 and you now should remember what angiotensin 2 does it increases tpr so direct action is raise uh, rising of the arterial blood pressure enormously and then you have a delayed component via the aldosterone uh, fluid retention wing of it and this causes that sustained chronic hypertension okay so this chap will come up with a sustained high blood pressure over months to years uh, maybe months rather because the, the blood pressure will be raging and this chap will need to be treated quickly and after a, a an imaging study you will find that there's a tumor <clears throat> the blood levels of renin will be abnormal you will go for imaging that would be the tumor you will you will need to treat that tumor and the whole thing will come back to normal so this is one of the examples where it's this axis which causes the hypertension and this axis relates to the renovascular aspect of the kidney number two is renal ischemia this is where the physiology pure physiology kicks in okay so Guyton discusses under renal ischemia further two aspects let me go slowly here by renal ischemia we mean that you have a decreased blood flow to the kidney to the to the extent that <clears throat> the normal 
filtration processes of the kidney, which the kidney is supposed to do, have decreased. GFR drops. So uh, if you decrease blood flow, ischemia causing decreased blood flow of the kidney, what are you doing? You're not supplying the kidney with enough blood for it to do its job, which is filtration, and then giving you uh, uh, back the, uh, the renal. Remember the renal blood flow that we talked about? that 20% becomes a filtration fraction and 80% is given back to the circulation, right? And even in that 20% filtration fraction, fraction, most of the stuff is reabsorbed and given back to the circulation. You remember all that discussion, I hope. So all of that is reduced when you decrease the blood supply of the kidney, okay? So what are you doing? You are basically retaining unfiltered blood in your circulation. That's one thing. Number two, what you are doing is you are asking the kidney to secrete renin. Okay. I need not go into detail why this renal ischemia will cause renin secretion. You should now be able to pick this up. Okay. So renal ischemia will cause renin secretion, which will then cause angiotensin II formation, which will then add to the woes of this patient. It will add on an already uh, uh, extra volume retained circulation, it will cause vasoconstriction, okay? And through its aldosterone wing, it will cause even more fluid retention, or even more uh, 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 retention of sodium and its attendant volume, uh, water. So <clears throat> all of this picture uh, should paint for you that renal ischemia will cause or exacerbate hypertension. Okay, I hope that is clear by my description. Now, if that is clear, if it's not clear, please pause this video. And what I've said up till now, just try to reconcile it with your knowledge of <clears throat> renin angiotensin II, aldosterone, uh, reflex, the whole flow chart, just read it again. And up, on, up till this point, you should be clear uh, about the statement that renal ischemia via this whole thing causes hypertension, okay? If you're clear on that, now we are good to go. Now we can talk about the two Goldblatt hypertension scenarios uh, that Guyton talks about. Goldblatt was the physician who studied this hypertension. So that's why his name is there. There's the one kidney Goldblatt hypertension and then there's a two kidney gold blood hypertension. Simply put, this scenario uh, is mostly uh, in transplanted kidneys or, or scenarios where the person has somehow lost one of his kidneys and is just working on one kidney. <clears throat> so single kidney. The person has a single kidney. Remember that. And in that single kidney, through various scenarios, it can be anything really, but it has to be vascular. Uh, in this single kidney, you have somehow managed to decrease decrease the flow of blood into the kidney. It can be renal artery stenosis. It can be any, any scenario where the resistance of the renal arterioles due to an atherosclerosis plaque or excessive vasoconstrictors, somehow the resistance has increased. So the nutshell is this kidney is not receiving its uh, allotted blood flow which in the single kidney means a lot of blood flow because the single kidney has to compensate for the absent kidney as well. So <clears throat> in this scenario, you have decreased the blood, blood flow to this kidney, causing renal ischemia, causing more renin, more angiotensin, more hypertension. So one kidney gold blood hypertension is basically due to uh, renal ischemia in a single kidney in this patient and uh, it's, it's attendant hypertension, okay? That's, that's this. Then you have uh, the two kidney uh, uh, Goldblatt hypertension. Uh, very simply, uh, this person can be, uh, uh, this person has two kidneys, but <clears throat> the stenosis, the atherosclerosis, whatever blockage is there, it's only in one kidney. Okay, so now imagine there are two kidneys, one kidney has the renal ischemia, the other is normal. Now the renal ischemic kidney will be forced to produce more renin, more angiotensin, all that business. 
but once the renin hits the blood it goes everywhere right it will go into the uh, kidney the, the normal kidney it will go to uh, the lungs and all that sort of thing and angio when angiotensin gets formed angiotensin 2 gets formed it will not differentiate which kidney are you so it will affect the uh, vasoconstriction of the efferents in the diseased in the uh, ischemic kidney and the normal kidney okay because angiotensin 2 does not know uh, which is which it is a vasoconstrictor it will just constrict all the vessels so normal kidney gets affected as well aldosterone when it gets formed it will not make a distinction between which uh, distal convoluted tubule do I have to uh, work on? It will uh, work on every DCT in both kidneys, the, the uh, ischemic and the normal. So the normal kidney also has to behave in the same way as the ischemic kidney. But the, the, the cause is different. The ischemic kidney is producing the increased renin, which is causing all of this havoc. While the disease, while the normal kidney is just responding to the high angiotensin two levels, okay. So the causes are different, but they end up uh, causing uh, fluid retention. Both of these kidneys end up causing fluid retention. So the response, the result is the same. However, the cause is different. Okay. This is called two kidney gallbladder hypertension. Uh, this is can be a viable question from good students. Uh, uh, maybe the person will be asked to define hypertension and <clears throat> depending on your confidence and your previous record uh, they can directly come to the difficult stuff i have uh, uh, intentionally skipped uh, a, a, a graphical representation uh, which guyton gives along this uh, topic it's a very good graph i was tempted to use the graph but then i was also sensitive about the <clears throat> amount of information that this lecture packs uh, and uh, the clinical information is also a lot for the first year to handle. That's why I've skipped that uh, that that graph. But but uh, the brave ones amongst you, uh, and I, I know there are some, they should go for that graph. It it is given in the section where it, he talks about <clears throat> hypertension with angiotensin being uh, being uh, the cause of it. Okay, it's it's near the uh, uh, latter third last third of the second chapter dealing with uh, long-term regulation control of, uh, of uh, blood pressure uh, let's hope you find that graph okay and if you have questions or if you want to comment on that graph specifically uh, you can again use the comment section <clears throat> of this uh, video lastly this chronic renin secretion it is not the same as the tumor okay this is actually quite different so this tumor is actually a tumor of the renin secreting cells. However, this scenario is uh, is uh, is interesting in the sense that uh, imagine a kidney which has part uh, ischemic tissue, patchy some some patch some patchy areas of uh, ischemia, while the rest of the tissue is the is the is is normal. So within within one kidney, you have uh, patchy areas of ischemia. With, uh, with interdispersed normal tissue so within the same kidney you can have uh, this effect how is the ischemic uh, parts of the of this kidney or both kidneys is the ischemic parts the bad parts will cause renin secretion will cause angiotensin 2 production so it's the same the, te the technology is the same okay and the, the only difference is that those patchy areas by instigating this formation uh, angiotensin 2 will then affect the normal parts of the kidney okay we're not talking about whole kidneys whole kidneys now we're talking about within the kidneys uh, the, the 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 ischemic sections producing renin and angiotensin 2 which then eventually affects the normal part to behave exactly in the two kidney gallbladder scenario so it, both the outcome is the same fluid retention but it's literally the two gallbladder uh, scenario within the same kidney okay i hope that's clear so these are the three 
uh, three uh, uh, feature the, the three scenarios of the kidney induced hypertension uh, aspect secondary hypertension <clears throat> and uh, with a with a, another reminder to please uh, go through the rest of the causes uh, of the secondary hypertension at least once uh, but really if you if you you, you cannot afford to skip this. This is the mainstay uh, because kidney is the number one cause of secondary hypertension. So you really cannot afford to skip this uh, this whole thing. However, reading those other uh, causes is also important. Okay. Uh, finally, uh, the references. And this is that document that I have mentioned uh, thoroughly in this presentation. So this basically... Uh, Bring us, brings us to the end of arterial blood pressure control, both acute and chronic. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuhu.